Okay, so uh, my name's Lorna and I work for BBC World News. And this is Mitch and you're the co-founder of Scully Helmets. Okay, so why don't you tell us first of all about the product and how you came up with the idea. Sure, so uh, we crashed a motorcycle. Go figure. Uh, the idea for Scully uh, kind of came from a dream. Uh, the story goes, lore, is uh, my brother was on his way to an appointment uh, in Barcelona in 2011, and he looked up to read a street sign off to his right. And as soon as he did that, a little red smart car slammed on the brakes in front of him. He had just enough time to hear the, the brakes squealing before he was smashing into the back of the car. Uh, he walked away from it, he was fine, a little bruised up, cuts, you know, scraped skin, but uh, otherwise fine. About six months later, he found himself out in Silicon Valley working for a semiconductor company. And random Wednesday night, he's having this dream where he's back on the motorcycle, except for there's a difference. He's got GPS navigation that's floating out in front of him like a hologram. So as he's driving along, he knows exactly where he's going. He doesn't need to look away from the road. So he sees the car slamming the brakes and he swerves around. Uh, he ended up waking up from a dead sleep 4 a.m. on a Wednesday, pulls out his laptop, and he's like, I've got to have this product. It has to exist. So he spent an hour trying to find the thing before he even realized, I don't even own a motorcycle right now. I want this product so badly that I'm willing to buy the product and figure out the motorcycle part of you know, the $10,000 purchase later because I have to have this. And uh, so called up, you know, he called up my dad, called us up, and he was like, you know, I've got this idea for a product. And our dad was like, okay, stop what you're doing, find a napkin, write it down, send it to the, uh, the USPTO. Like, get that on file right away. Make it. Do it. Uh, and so he started kind of tinkering with it, duct taping some consumer electronics together, and ended up with this uh, head-up display platform that took a 180-degree viewing of a rear-facing camera, GPS navigation, and telemetry information, and placed it in a semi-transparent heads-up display that kind of floats out in front of you like a hologram. So that's what we are. Okay, so um, how difficult is it to control it? Uh, the short answer is you don't. Uh, the system is designed so that it actually pulls information out of the environment. It pulls things away from what you would otherwise pay attention to. In a car or on a motorcycle, you have multiple different points that you have to attend to. Just to be able to pilot the, the you know, Outside of checking your Facebook or looking at, you know, whatever, oh, I need to see my Twitter feed, text messaging, all the things that you're not supposed to do, but just the basic things, the basic operation of the vehicle involves looking at, you know, two or three different sets of mirrors. You have, uh, you have to look over your shoulders on each side to check your blind spots. If you know where you're going, great. You don't have to look at a GPS map, but for the majority of us in, you know, the first world, we basically rely on GPS now. So you have your GPS system that you have to pay attention to. You still have to keep your eyes on the road, and then that's nothing for what's in, you know, actually behind you, especially on a motorcycle. Your rear view mirrors, the only thing that you really see is your elbows. So the entire time you're shifting your body around, you're looking around, you're taking all of that time where you're not watching the road. We're taking all of those things, all of those different points, including your actual telemetry, your gauges in your car or on your bike, and placing that in that head display. So you have two points of focus, the road and the display. Okay, this is all very well, but I'm, I don't own a motorbike, so um, if I was to take one of these, I'd be a learner driver. You know, isn't it all a little bit distracting? Well, it's about as distracting as a rear view mirror. The, the idea is, is that you have to see behind you. You have to see the sides of you, you have to check your blind spots. Those are all just the basic necessities of driving a vehicle. And right now, the the accepted system is a technology as old as Jesus. You look in a mirror, you attend to the information, or rather you look at the mirror, focus on the mirror, focus out to what you're trying to see, then try to go back to your you know, driving environment and focus back out again. So you have multiple different processes of focusing, multiple different processes of you know, attending to information. When it comes down to distraction, a distraction is just a function of time. Our system is designed to uh, be infinitely focused, meaning that it is focused to the same distance as the road. So you're not actually looking at the display and focusing on it. You just glance at the display, you read it across, and you're back on the road. So in milliseconds, it's actually a negative distraction. Okay, and what about, um, is it legal to drive with one of these on at the moment? I know the um, laws vary from state to state in the US, for example. Mm -hmm. So there is no 
law that outright bans head-up display. It's one of those things where um, the Department of Transportation and the European Council uh, have kind of been open to the idea of innovation. They've put out uh, distracted driving guidelines, which are dictated by uh, research that has been done by um, several different sanctioning bodies. One of them is uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, they have a, a massive transportation lab that does tons of research. They have a body of research that uh, spans back about 40 years uh, into head-up display and uh, human performance, human factors design. And so they've taken all of that information, compiled it together, and handed it off to these companies, these automakers, to say, this is the way that you do head-up display uh, responsibly. This is the information that you can give. Here's how you can present it. Everything else we leave up to you. And so we've taken the all of those guidelines and said, OK, this is the bare minimum. And we're going to exceed every single one of these specifications in our product. So. You know, everyone's heard of the Google Glass thing. You know, you get pulled over wearing Google Glass and you can get a ticket if they can prove that it was on the wall, you know, while you're driving. That's not a system that's optimized and designed specifically for transportation. Ours is. Okay, so it'd be okay for insurance and everything then? And actually, insurance companies are very interested to see this kind of technology come out because, you know, especially for first time drivers, people that aren't used to driving on the road free. For instance, yourself, if you decided to you know, jump on a Vespa uh, tomorrow, having that kind of situational awareness technology to assist you to augment your senses and make you more capable of uh, dealing with your environment, the driving environment, all of the chaos, especially around London, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, it makes it so much easier to, you know, acclimate to that whole process. Driving is very difficult. We are not designed to go 60 miles an hour. And now you finally have a system that actually brings your brain up to speed with all of the innovation that's come, you know, in transportation. Okay, so you, you start shipping next year. You're going to check every single helmet before you send it out? Check every single helmet. Well, check and make sure, you know, it's safe. <laughs> You're doing tests at the moment. Yes, yeah, absolutely. There, uh, there's a very extensive process that uh, helmets have to go through uh, to pass DOT, EC regulations. Um, the standards are very stringent to pass both. Uh, so you end up with a product that is uh, extremely robust and designed for uh, a very large set of different circumstances, crash circumstances, and everything. That said, we've designed the entire system, including the helmet shell itself, to exceed all of those things, to be able to give you more peripheral view and more capabilities, more functionality, more connectivity. Uh, than any of those systems designed because it's not good enough to just protect your head in the event of an accident. We need to keep your head away from accidents altogether, and that's the stance that we're taking. Okay, what about people that wear glasses or suffer from epilepsy? Makes no difference. Actually, uh, we've noticed a significant uh, performance improvement for people with glasses because the head of display is focused to infinity. So uh, biologically, your brain doesn't act, or your eye doesn't actually see it, so it doesn't have to focus on the image. It sees it as already in focus. So if you're nearsighted, for instance, you can't read things up close, it's automatically in focus without your glasses. Okay, so um, motorbike helmets last around five years, and then they need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. What about the Scully? It will be, we recommend the same. The reason why is because uh, the expanded polystyrene inside of the helmet that actually uh, does the impact absorption is uh, it has a shelf life. You know, as you add hair chemicals and all those kinds of things, all the rock star hairstyles that you see running around on motorcycles, everyone's got these crazy hair products that they put on. And over time with wear, you know, just glues in general, they, they come apart, those foams, they start to degenerate and everything. And so, you know, you're going to want to replace, replace those parts of it. That said, we do refurbish the systems with new helmets because it's not, it's not enough to just say like, oh, okay, you crash your helmet, you're, you're screwed. The system can potentially still be good. It can still be rebuilt. And so we can take those components, we can take a new helmet shell, because we're not going to recycle those, and just build it again. So you have that capability. Now that said, in five years, you know, in 2020, you're not going to be running around with an iPhone 5. Right? And so it'd be kind of the same thing. Because who here has got a pager? Show of hands? OK. Okay, so let's just um, bring it back to some of the functionalities. So it's called Bluetooth, so that means that I can make calls, stream music. Absolutely. But you know, motorbike, I've been 
I would have thought it would, you know, it's nice to get on the road as an escape from it all. Do you not think that's a little bit too much going on? Both of those have actually shown to have a protective effect in research. Uh, it was kind of one of those things where the community kind of batted it back and forth. Oh, driving with a phone is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now it's not dangerous. Um, and the, the ultimate finding has been it actually has a protective effect to have a conversation with people because it activates a different part of your brain. And that separate part of your brain makes your whole brain more active. It increases the electrical activity. So in a way, in the same way that uh, playing a musical instrument can just make you more intelligent in general. It's, it's the same kind of thing. So having that engagement of that part of your brain brings more focus to what you're doing. And so having those capabilities and do it, executing them responsibly is different than, for instance, putting up scrolling text messages where you're just reading the information completely distracted from what you're doing. Yeah, that definitely won't be illegal. But then, <laughs> but you might, might like it's, it's loud. How's that going to affect? the engine noise, how that can they affect the GPS and all the other functions? So we've actually designed a system uh, to solve for that particular issue. It's one of those things where uh, motorcycle riders will often experience uh, significant or total hearing loss um, over a long career of riding bikes. Uh, and it's because of the design of these helmets, uh, basically it necessitates you either wear earplugs or you go deaf. And uh, that all comes down to the aerodynamics. So far, that problem really hasn't been solved. They just try to add more materials, more weight to the helmets, and hope that it'll kind of deaden the sound. We've taken the approach of changing the industrial design, including our fin shape, which not only houses and firewalls off all of the electronics inside of the helmet, so in the event of an accident, it separates, but it also actually takes the wind and forces it to buff it behind the helmet, behind the back of your neck, um, where it's not perceptible. So when you're inside of the helmet, having a conversation with somebody on the phone, you can be talking at you know, the same volume that we are right now, and the person will be able to hear you perfectly clearly. You've got a friend. <laughs> there are other products on the market which offer GPS, which you just add on, clip on to your existing helmet, ski helmet, motorbike helmet. They're cheaper than the Scully. Why wouldn't I go out and buy one of those? That would probably be a great question for Michael Schumacher. Um, as you all know, uh, Michael Schumacher right now is... Uh, out I believe of hospital? He is, okay, so he is out of hospital right now, but he uh, suffered a very serious accident uh, because of a GoPro. He was riding, uh, or sorry, he was skiing, wearing a, a skiing helmet, and he had a normal skiing accident. He hit his head on a rock, but he's wearing a retrofit. And that retrofit penetrated the helmet, shredded it, and caused him to have a near-fatal brain injury. Something so simple as just, you know, it, it's not designed for it. The, the, you know, whenever you retrofit something, it's not part of the initial design. And so without vertical integration, you end up missing out on the key safety factors and then a lot of the functionality. <laughs> okay, so it's been... You've described it, you've described it as like the Google Glass of the motor, motor bike helmet, sorry. Um, are you already thinking of apps, ways that you can create apps to go with it? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, for us, there's a million different things you can do, right? Yeah. Once you, I mean, the smartphone kind of opened up the world to everybody. Now you have connectivity absolutely everywhere. You can connect your watch, your phone, you know, little tracker devices, all sorts of things. Uh, we're planning on opening that up. Our core competency is intelligent transportation systems, making driving, making you know, transportation safer. We're going to open up the rest of it, the fun stuff, to everyone in this room, everyone in the world, and say, okay, here's the open API, here's the things that you can't do, now go nuts. And then you know, we're going to kind of give this technology to the people, because the people are going to be the ones that are going to dictate the innovation. And so you know, we're excited. We're excited to see what they can do. Okay, but then there is a risk, though, if you open it up to third party, you know, third parties creating apps that, you know, it's going to become, how are you going to regulate whether these are distracting, you know? I mean, we're going to be very opinionated. Very big about, on safety. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're going to be very opinionated about what goes in the head of display. Um, it's not useful for this device, and it, should, it will never exist uh, that you'll have an authorized Scully app for playing YouTube videos. It's just not going to happen, so don't ask. <laughs> Uh, there are certain things like text messages. You'll never see a text message in a Scully home unless the thing is hacked. Um, it's never going to be something that we're going to endorse or support. Uh, 
and that's something that we're going to do everything that we can to make sure it does not exist. Now that said, there are a lot of things we can do in the background without using the head-up display in particular, or responsibly use the head-up display to, um, you know, to connect people. Also, we have this uh, this vertical of voice commands, localized voice commands that gives you a whole new world of you know capabilities. You don't necessarily need to see the information; you can hear it and interact with it without actually touching it or seeing it. And so. You know, it, it's up to the developers to kind of be more creative than just, okay, what can I put in a display and, you know, play around with. What about integrating into the actual bikes themselves? So we actually just recently were at uh, Intermont with Continental demonstrating uh, that very thing. We'll be at uh, ICMA in Milan uh, from the 6th to the 9th of November uh, demonstrating the same. So people are welcome to come out and see uh, Scully helmet integrated with the motorcycle, taking head-up display, uh, telemetry information, you know, rendering it with infinite focus. So it's a real thing. You said that the Scully helmet's like your first step and in journey into the wearable market, wearable technology. Where do you see the uh, market going? Invisible. My sense invisible. has always been that wearables will become invisible and then we'll all rejoice because nobody wants to see it. Nobody wants to hear about it. You don't want to, you know, it's not a fashion statement. Like, it, it's supposed to be something that creates a, a useful experience. And for us, you know, as much of this technology as we can make disappear, uh, the better. So for us, it's going to really come down to uh, minimizing the technology, minimizing the invasiveness, and just creating this, this experience where you can truly connect with the world rather than with all of the crap that you're wearing or all the stuff that's out there, everyone else's cell phone. I don't want to know what your cell phone is doing. I just want to know that I'm not going to run into you on the road. And so really honing in on that experience is going to be the biggest for us. OK, let's, uh, let's talk about funding. You had a really successful um, crowdfunding on the Indiegogo, which ended earlier this month. Yep, uh, that was on the 9th at midnight. Yeah, raised over 2 million US dollars. Yep. You know, how did you, well, why do you think it was so successful, and how did you keep the momentum going during the campaign? It's one of those crazy things where, you know, you jump off a cliff and you hope that, like, there's, uh, you know, feather pillows at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, you can sit there and you can speculate about numbers and all the other things, like, all you want until you're blue in the face. We had about 150,000 people that had signed up as beta testers uh, prior to the campaign. But you never really know if that's going to translate to money. You, you wonder if they think, like, oh, OK, I'm just going to get something for free. Awesome. Uh, and then they all showed up. You know, We let them know that the product was out there, that this is a real thing. We're going to be shipping in May. Uh, and they all showed up. And they said, OK, if it's, gonna, if it's real and you're going to make it, we want it. And uh, it blew up. Uh, I mean, we were sitting there in absolute disbelief. Like, we had speculated, like, oh, we think it'll, it'll do pretty well. But when it actually hit our goal in eight minutes, we were just sitting there shouting expletives, uh, just in complete disbelief. Uh, Your goal was like quarter of a million, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And so within the first eight minutes, we were just like astonished. We hit half a million uh, within an hour. And then uh, at 45 hours, we hit uh, a million. It was just like no sleep the entire time because you're just sitting there watching the numbers and like just mind boggled because they haven't seen it. Nobody's seen it before. Uh, we'd only done uh, one public demonstration prior to that, so it wasn't as though they were, you know, they'd seen it, they tried it out in the store, and they were like, "Okay, yeah, this is awesome. I'm going to buy it." They were like, "No, faith time. Let's let's do this." And so, uh, I mean, just really acknowledging uh, all of our. You know, our fans, all the people that uh, purchased the helmets and jumped off the cliff with us. Uh, I think that really helped with the, the momentum because, I mean, this is a movement owned by, you know, all of our followers. It has nothing to do with us. Okay, and uh, what advice would you give any of these people in the room here now who want to break into the wearable industry? Or we'll do exactly what you did? Just jump. You just have to jump and go for it, make sure you're solving something for people. So make the world a better place, not in the Silicon Valley like everyone thinks that they're making the world a better place by you know, multifaceted search or something like that, but something that truly enhances people's lives. Do something that solves a problem for you, and then pursue it with absolutely everything. And you know, be opinionated, make mistakes, be OK with that. Get feedback from people and throw it in the dustbin. Like, do all of those things, just go for it. Because you'll find your own success, you'll find your own happiness. And if you're doing something you love for, you know, to solve a problem for yourself, 
Uh, you're never going to wake up in the morning and be like, oh, I don't want to go to work. Okay. I wonder if we've got any time for any questions. Does anybody in the audience want to ask? So, congrats for the success on our campaigns. Like, really, uh, like you're in one of the top ranking projects on Indiegogo, right? So, that's a pretty good achievement. So, my question it's is weird hearing you say that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very hard to break into the million dollar project. So, so uh, it's like less than 1% of the project to get there. Um, so, my question is kind of like a different part, but basically, how did you prepare for crowdfunding? Did you get investment before crowdfunding? And what was then the. So I'll be doing a crowdfunding talk in just a moment. I don't want to take all of the thunder out of that one. Um, but to, to kind of hit on those uh, really quickly, uh, we did have funding prior to. Uh, one of the biggest things for us was uh, demo fall 2013. So events similar to, uh, you know, like a wearable Wednesday, you know, some, a launch platform to get people aware of it, showing them the experience, showing them that this is a, like a real tangible thing that can actually be executed on, and like letting them imagine. Uh, and then just tapping those people repeatedly. They want to help you. If they signed up on your list, they want to be a part of your movement. So leverage them. Don't be afraid to ask them questions. Don't be afraid to ask them for money. Don't be afraid to you know solicit their feedback or you know te maybe test things with them. Um, <coughs> they they're there for you. That's why they signed up. How many people do you have on the list to build free crowdfunding? We had about a hundred and fifty thousand. Yes. Um, over what period of time do you build it? Since uh, demo. We went into demo fall 2013, uh, October of, no, that's not correct. It, it was fall of 2013, and uh, we had about 100 people uh, that were on the beta list. And by the end of that event, we had about 10,000. So it was just massive, um, you know, exponential growth. Uh, that just kind of continued through the year, and the more information that we gave, the more people that signed up, the more people that talked about it, and, uh, you know, we, we kept engaging with people, we kept sending them unique content, and they just kept eating it up and kept telling people about it. Okay. Um, this is, uh, are you thinking you're always going to sell this direct to yourself, or is this a project you're thinking you're going to take it into retailers in the future? I mean, there's a million different ways to skip a cat. Um, right now, we wanted to sell directly because we wanted to see, you know, what are people's concerns, what are the, the touch points that consumers really care about, what are the, you know, the risks and concerns and things, uh, and we really wanted to craft the, the user experience because it's very rare that you get to build a brand and launch something, you know, from scratch and have it be successful and now we have this opportunity to create uh, the, that experience, the brand experience. Uh, to directly hand that off to you know third-party retailers or you know, whomever else. Uh, I mean, if you bought this thing at Walmart, you're going to have a completely different experience than if you buy it from me and I put it in your hands and you know, give you a walkthrough demo. Here's all the features. This is how it all works. Uh, so for the time being, it's going to be direct to consumer, um, so that they can reach out directly to us. Uh, that said, you'll probably see it in stores someday. Um, when that is, I don't know. <laughs> One more question. Yeah. Um, so, boring tech question. What um, optical system are you using to deliver the display? You didn't have it. It's our own proprietary optic system. We designed the thing from scratch. Okay, so is it sort of like, uh, like a dual glass type sort of mirror, or, or can you give a bit of insight how it works? It's some, the, the simplest answer is it's similar to Google Glass, uh, but it's made of a completely different set of components. <laughs> Do we have one more very good question? <laughs> it could get very boring. It could get very, very technical. Somewhat technical, but short answer is it's not that interesting. <laughs> Our last question. Yeah, you mentioned you raised some funding prior to crowdfunding. Can you comment on how much and how did you do that? What, what did you have to show to raise funding at that day? Uh, the first money was raised in May of 2013, and it was raised off of more or less a duct tape prototype. There was a helmet, there was some Bondo, um, a rear camera from a car, and it was ugly, and it was extremely heavy. Um, 
but it showed what the product could be. Um, it wasn't made out of anything proprietary, it was all off the shelf, you know, car electronics, components, whatever. Um, that got things started. We started building more prototypes. Uh, in the end, we raised about <coughs> 2.5 million uh, prior to the campaign. Our campaign, our crowdfunding campaign really wasn't for crowdfunding to get the money. We didn't need the money for that. It was more of a validation of the market, validating that people truly wanted the product and were willing to spend the amount uh, that it cost to build it. Uh, and overwhelmingly, the, the answer was yes. I just want to tell people how much it does cost. Oh, yes. Uh, so they were, up until the 9th, available on our website uh, for a pre-launch discount of $1,399. When they go full retail, it'll be $1,499.